Hello there, and welcome to episode three of User One Retro Goes to the Movies. I'm going to start a new series which looks at Star Trek movies, and I'm quite excited about this because I absolutely love Star Trek. Um, I do like um, Star Wars as well, but for me, I think over the years, I think I've come to appreciate Star Trek a bit more. Excuse me. Yeah, I've come to appreciate Star Trek just that little bit more. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear the fan going. It's, it's even though it's been thunderstorming and raining, it's still quite warm. So, <laughs> um, and uh, I think I'll, I, I I hold them both close, like close to my heart and that. But I think I I do like, as I say, I do like Star Trek that a little bit more. Um, and so for this first episode, it's going to be a two-fold episode. It's, I'm going to be looking at the film and doing an unboxing as well. And the film in question is the first in the series, and what I think is, it is a great movie. I, I love this film. I always have. I'll always champion it. And... Even though some people do say it is slow, I still I still love it, and it is Star Trek the Motion Picture the Director's Edition. Now this new, all new version came out yesterday, and this set is five discs. The American version has three. It hasn't got two extra Blu-rays, and I'll get onto that in a minute. Get onto that in a minute. But first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the film. Um, obviously released in uh, on December seventh, nineteen seventy nine, in the US. I think we got it just after Christmas here in nineteen eighty. Um, story centers around um, a mass of energy that is heading towards Earth. It destroys three Klingon cruisers. It destroys the Epsilon Nine space station, and. Um, the only ship um, in interception range is the USS Enterprise, and Captain Kirk, who's now an admiral, has been behind the desk for two and a half years. So since the end of since the end of the series, since the end of the series, um, hypothetically, when season three ended, the adventures carried on. Let's just say off camera. For another two years so they completed the five-year mission and uh, and then after that Kirk was made an admiral uh, for Starfleet Starfleet strategic command I think it is or something like that anyway and um, so yeah he's now behind a desk uh, and he recommends Captain Willard Decker who's the son of Commodore Matt Decker from the episode Doomsday Machine. Um, he recommends him to succeed him as captain of the Enterprise. And when this emergency situation arises, he goes to Starfleet Admiral Nagura and basically, in so many words, says that he's the best one to take command of the ship. Um, as he does so, which infuriates um, Decker. So he thinks he's betrayed him, even though he recommended him. And um, basically, the rest of the crew were brought back together. Um, Uhura, Scott is already on board because he, he oversaw the 18 month refit. Chekhov's there as well. Um, and, uh, and Sulu, Sulu as well. Um, Spock, meanwhile, is on Vulcan doing his. Um, Colin R. Ritual that purges all of his human emotion. Um, while he's doing this, he receives um, a telepathic um, message, so to speak, um, from an outside force in space. Um, and so it interferes with his Colin R. Ritual. So he goes off to basically find the answers that he seeks out in space while on while on board um, before the ship sets out McCoy comes back sporting a very 
<laughs> very Bee Gees like beard and suit. Um, <laughs> oh, there, there's uh, there's many uh, many a meme and uh, thing going around of disco bones is in the house and things like that. It's quite funny, but um, yeah. So he comes back and um, the ship sets off, but it's not finished. Um, it go it gets pulled into a wormhole due to an engine imbalance, um, and then it comes. Then they manage to to get out of the wormhole. Spot comes on board a little bit later, helps to rebalance the engines and then they go off to intercept this alien presence. Now, many people have said that the film is slow. Um, yes, there are some long lingering shots. Um, the first one is the tour of, uh, around the outside of the Enterprise that Scotty takes Kirk on. And the re and I love the whole sequence, even though it is one big glorious, like, look what we've done and all that. But the thing is, it serves a dual purpose. It's to basically show the Enterprise it is now. It's like, look at what the Enterprise is. Look at how we've changed it. You know, look how different it is from its TV counterpart. There's, there's, there's no proper radar kind of dish on the front of the Enterprise, on the, on the actual main body of the ship, on the engineering section of the ship. That's gone. Um, the nacelles are more streamlined, more sleek. They're not round. They're more oblong, um, and I think they look much better than the the ones in the original series. So the original series Enterprise is iconic. Many people have said that the motion picture Enterprise is possibly the greatest ship ever, and I have to agree with that. I think it's possibly one of the most gorgeous-looking ships like science fiction ships I've ever seen in my life. I really do, I, I, I do believe that, I really do. Um, but yeah, people have said that the, the, the shot could have been shortened, maybe, but for me, it's a sense of grandeur. You know, you get, you get a look at the new ship and how it is, as I said. And also, the other purpose that it serves is a captain looking over his ship. You know, no, I'm 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 under the impression that I mean, a captain likes to look over the outside of his ship before he gets on board to make sure everything's shipshape. Let's just say um, that's how I look at it, and that's what I take away from it. Um, so it serves a bit of a purpose. And mind you, being directed by Robert Wise, he's got a, he had a very keen eye. Very, very keen eye. Very, he wanted everything, like the minute detail and everything. You know, I mean, I, I love many of Robert Wise's movies, and especially the sci-fi movies like The Andromeda Strain and uh, The Day of the Earth which is an absolute classic. If you haven't seen it, get it watched. The Day of the Earth Stood Still, the 1950s classic. Absolutely brilliant film and the remake doesn't even hold the candle to it. Even though Keanu Reeves is great in it, it doesn't hold the candle to the original. It really doesn't. Um, but yeah, as I say, I do love that whole sequence with like going around the Enterprise and taking a look at it. A long, long, hard, loving look. I always have like that, and plus it's accompanied by Jerry Goldsmith's best score. I think it's his best score. Without a shadow of a doubt, he's done some fantastic ones over the years. Uh, Gremlins, the Burbs, uh, Explorers, um, Star Trek V, First Contact, Nemesis, uh, Insurrection, right, you know, um, Looney Tunes Back in Action, another one for Joe Dante. Um, <clears throat> and then you've got the, the unused score from, from Legend, because I think it was then redone by Tangerine Dream. You know, I think. To me, Jerry Goldsmith is the the best composer, and John Williams, and James Horner, in that order. They've all done some magnificent scores, but I think Jerry Goldsmith, for me, is cream of the crop. Absolutely fantastic score, and it's just sad that he's that he's no longer with us. I mean, he died, I think it was in 2002, 2003 from cancer, and um, you know, 
I adore his scores. I really do. And he's, that's one person who I would have loved to have met, along with Robert Wise as well. I would have loved to have met him. I really do. Just a shame I never got the chance. But anyway, back to the film. Um, the other long lingering shot is the one, uh, the, the, the Vija flyover. Some people have said that it's too long and it's, it bogs the film down. Again, while I do get where they're coming from, the thing is, it's again, it's a sense of grandeur, it's a sense of scale, sense of scope. You know, it's basically saying, Vija is fucking huge, absolutely huge, massive. You know, and the, the Enterprise is literally, it's like that, against a ship that's huge. In the original version, it's supposed to be 82 AUs in diameter. Now, AU is um, a, a unit of, of space from, from here to, to the sun. And 82 AUs is literally Earth to the sun times two. That's huge. Absolutely bloody huge. Huge shit. Um, but then when they'd done the original direct edition in 2002, they cut it down to just two. So it's two AUs in diameter. And that's still quite huge. Consider, as I say, considering how big the Enterprise is. So it'd be like the equivalent of of an ant to us, I suppose would be an ideal comparison, you know. Um, but still, though, when the again, when the ship flies over in the direct edition, it has been tweaked so it, it does feel a little bit faster, and it does. And you still get the sense of scale, sense of scope. And when you, when you see it and all the detail on it, the ship of Vija is absolutely, it's a beautiful ship. Another beautiful ship. Um, and as I say, you do get that sense of scale of like how big the ship actually is. Fantastic, fantastic model work. Um, Especially by like John Dykstra and Douglas Trumbull, Douglas Trumbull, who done, uh, who directed uh, Silent Running and Brain Brainstorm in the seventies. Um, two films I haven't seen. I have got Silent Running. I still haven't watched it yet. Um, and Brainstorm, I think, was the the, the latter half of the seventies. It was about seventy six, I think. Another film I definitely need to see. Um, but no, he was an absolute master of his craft. Done the special effects for two thousand and one, um, which again. One of my favourite sci-fi films. I'm a big sci-fi junkie. Really, especially the big, epic sci-fi movies that you don't really see no more. And I do think that Star Trek The Motion Picture is the last of the huge, epic sci-fi movies. You know? Um, I mean, I suppose you could put The Black Hole in there as well, even though it's only about an hour and 40 minutes, hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes in length. It's another film that has an overture at the beginning. Um, and it, even, even though it's got a short run length, to me it's still epic. Because it's still it's got some good ideas in there. Some some leaps of logic. Some leaps of logic I will I will I will grant you. But I love the film. It's so it's such a good film that you can't help but just think, you know, I'll let that slide. I'll let that slide. I'll let that slide because you're having a good time. And, as I say, for me, Star Trek The Motion Picture is the last of those grand, epic sci-fi movies. Um, as I say, it's all, all down to, as I say, Douglas Trumbull and John Dykstra, who've done the effects for Star Wars um, two years before. Um, just absolutely fantastic effects, you know. Um, and... Again, it's just, for me, it's just a great film. Absolutely great film, and I, I love it. The, 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 the behind the scenes dramas that, that plagued the film, they have all been um, discussed in depth. 
Um, but in a nutshell, it's basically that the film was constantly being, well, the script was constantly being rewritten on set, and they would have to date it and time it to like say like this was when the change was done and, and things like that. Um, special effects shots weren't done on time by the original special effects house, which was uh, Robert Abel and Associates. In fact, they blew the whole of the special effects budget on one shot, which did end up in the movie, and it was the one on the bridge. Um, after the Vija flyover, and it was the massive, it was the long cylindrical, well, let's say cylindrical, the long energy probe on the bridge that, that goes around uh, and in the end zaps Ilea and takes her away. And uh, yeah, so they were fired, and then Douglas Trumbull and Don, John Dykstra, I think John Dykstra was brought on board, I think. Um, and yeah, they managed to get the special effects near enough completed. Um, before the film came out and there was even a, a, a story where Robert Wise actually took the print under his arm to the premiere I think it's at Man's Chinese Theatre I think it was in San Francisco and the print apparently was still wet um, but yeah um, I would have given anything to have been on that at that premiere in 1979 but obviously it was three years before I was born and I don't think they would have let uh, a fetus into the into the cinema, um, yeah. So, but as I say, I, I I first watched the film. I think it was about eighty. It was either eighty eight, eighty nine, or ninety. And it was a Betamax copy that I was given. And as a six slash seven slash eight year old, I got the sense of wonder, the sense of scope, um, and also got the sense of how big the threat of Vija was as well. Um, I didn't quite get the human drama, like the human like like, like drama side of, of, of the film. I didn't get that until um, a couple of viewings later. But then when I did, boy, I got a hell of a lot more out of it. As soon as I got that, basically, as a whole, all these sides came together. You've got Kirk as one side of this of this film, and it's basically a story of how he longs to be back in command, and like how arrogant he is, and how he's changed in the two and a half years since the end of the five year mission and how he would do anything to get command of the Enterprise back even screw over someone who he's recommended and he knows you know um, and then the whole character arc of him basically he warms back into the role of captain you know and he he gets to know a bit more of the Enterprise and how it actually works and that through Decker you know, and Decker helps him basically become the captain who he used to be. And they they form not a close friendship, but they form a kind of like, I want to say trust, you know, um, not, a, not a bond, but I'll, I'll get the word, I'll get the word in a minute. So you've got that side of it, you know, and then you've got when Bones comes on as well, about half an hour into the movie. He helps him as well become the person that he used to be. Because there's there's one scene just as they've left the solar system. Kirk wants to use the warp drive, but in the words of Scotty, it needs further warp simulation on the flow sensors. Um, and then Kirk says, we need warp speed now. And then Bone says, Jim, you're pushing. Your people know their jobs. He's like, he's like the Jiminy Cricket. He's constantly talking to him in his ear, trying to remind him that basically his crew are trying to do their job and he's trying to 
push them, push them to do stuff that the ship isn't ready for. It really isn't. Um, because basically it's long time finished. Um, and so you've got that side and he helps him to, be, to also become a better person. I mean, there's, there's one scene in Kirk's quarters as well, which is quite a, quite a good scene. Um, and there's, um, I think Decker nails it on the head, literally nails, nails on the head, you know, why Kirk wasn't the right fit for this mission he says you haven't logged a single star hour in two and a half years that plus your unfamiliarity with the ship's redesign in my opinion sir seriously jeopardizes this mission and it's that which makes kirk think shit i think he might be right and that's when he turns around and says i trust your nurse made me through these difficulties mister and he goes yes sir i'll do that and i think it's then when kirk kind of realizes you're right you're right this is a totally new ship it's not like the enterprise of old where i knew where everything was i don't know and i'm gonna need your help to coach me coach me you know where everything is how the ship works and all that help me you know and bones kind of reiterates that a bit later on in that scene when he says um there's, there, there's a bit in the TV episode where he says, a ship's doctor, I'm now discussing the subject of command fitness. You know, and he questions whether he's actually fit to be in command again. Again, after two and a half years of being behind a desk at Starfleet. You know, he goes, um, it's you who's competing for command of the Enterprise. You know, you rammed getting this command down Starfleet's throat. You've used this emergency to get the Enterprise back. And Kirk goes, and I intend to keep her, is that what you're saying? And he goes, yes, it's an obsession. It's an obsession that can blind you to far more immediate and critical responsibilities. And your reaction to Decker is an example. So he's basically, to me, what he's saying is that his obsession to be captain of the Enterprise has made him blind to the big picture i've probably got this completely wrong completely wrong but yeah it's made him blind to the big picture about who's actually right for command of the enterprise for this mission you know his i suppose greed for wanting to go back or selfishness sorry selfishness his selfishness for wanting to be back in space um for wanting to be back in the captain's chair has blinded him to the fact that Decker is a better fit to be captain of this of this whole mission of the ship um, and if he's not careful it's gonna cost him big and that's quite that's quite an interesting thing for Star Trek because Star Trek as a whole it deals with ideas like that and into the unknown and, and stuff like that. And that's quite philosophical for a Star Trek film, like for, for, for sci-fi. You know, I always find that most sci-fi is philosophical, especially with 2000, going, like going back to 2001. You know, so it's, it's bringing more philosophical ideas into, into the realm of Star Trek. And, uh, you know, and that's the second, the second side of this pyramid. The third side is Spock and his whole, his whole journey from being on Vulcan doing his Colinar ritual to having something call to him from space, this consciousness, which turns out to be Vija, to go into the Enterprise to basically going on his walk, mind melding with whatever's in there, 
and then basically having a eureka moment after that spock walk his whole thing is you know can he be trusted has he come along to help them or for his or for selfish reasons and even though some people would think hang on a minute that's not spock's way he's not selfish at least i don't think he is for this because it's something important to the vulcan way of life purging all emotion purging his human side it's more of a spiritual journey for him and as soon as he makes contact and does that mind meld he gets it he's like shit you know and he basically he he thinks of Vija as the same as him looking for something wanting to know if there's more in the universe than there is you know if there's another level of existence that it can actually attain you know because it's always learning it's always wanting to know more it's the constant need for knowledge you know and um, like it as I say it just wants to know more and there's one pivotal scene that was removed for the theatrical version that was put back into both the special longer version on TV in 1983 and the direct edition, both versions of the direct edition. And they've gone into the, through the Vija orifice and they've gone into this other room and they're flying towards um, where Vija is. Excuse me. And Kirk turns to Spock. And Spock's like this, just looking at his computer. And as Kirk walks up to him, he says, Spock. And as he turns, he's got a single tear rolling from his cheek. Kirk goes, not for us. And Spock goes, no, Captain, not for us, for Vija. I weep for Vija as I would for a brother. As I was when I came aboard, so is Vija now. Empty, incomplete, and searching. Logic and knowledge are not enough. And to me, what that's saying is that Vija needs human experience, a, hum a human element to make it better than it is. And it mirrors Spock. Spock needs his human half to make him who he is. You know, and that's what I mean. It's actually deeper than, oh, an energy cloud's coming towards Earth, and the Enterprise has to go and get it. There's a lot of lingering shots, um, and it's boring. There's no action. There might not be a lot of action, but it's a film that makes you think. And that, I think, to me, is just as important as loads of phaser fights, loads of space battles, you know, loads of fisticuffs, you know, as like what um, Star Wars did in 1977. You know, if a science fiction movie can make you think, then it's done part of its job. And that's why I will always love Star Trek The Motion Picture, because it's always constantly making you think. It, it does to me anyway. It always constantly makes me think, you know, and makes me think as a human being, I could be better, you know. I could push myself to be a better person, you know, and, and do better in my life. And that's something quite fundamental to take away from a, from a Star Trek film. And as I say, for me, that, it's done its job, as well as, to me, entertain. It's made me think. You don't get that in sci-fi movies nowadays. Nowadays, they're all brainless you know, kind of things. I mean, take take Moonfall, for instance. You know, it's all about um, the moon coming down to Earth and all these like conspiracy theory things and like see all this destruction and, and stuff like that. But not once did it make me think it was just a brainless action movie with sci-fi stapled to it. Um, and yes, I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it in a in a 
crap movie kind of way because it's one of those throwaway movies you can just put on not have to worry about it not have to think and just enjoy it. and i know we all need that at this time of life and in this current climate but a film like star trek the motion picture that makes you think you know when people just want laser fights and stuff like that it's di it was different back well, it was the it was the end of a, as I say, of an epic science fiction era. I don't think we'll ever get back again. You know, I mean, it's like if you take a look at musicals. There's not really a lot of musicals made today, and yet back in the forties and fifties and sixties, there was a hell of a lot. Carousel, South Pacific, Sound of Music, West Side Story. You know, and then you've got like the minor, like the the. The minor ones as well. I mean, even in the 70s, you had the likes of Greece, and in 1982, you had Greece too. But then that was like kind of like it started to tail off. Um, I mean, obviously, you had the musical TV series Glee, and um, you had what else was it? You had the remake of West Side Story directed by Steven Spielberg recently. But you don't hardly see musicals anymore. You know, it's the same with like hard science fiction, science fiction that makes you think that makes you question. As I say, that's something of a rarity nowadays, and I think that was the last, is the last true epic hard sci-fi movie. And for me, it's all the better for it. It really is. And it's, it's just a shame that it took 20 years for Robert Wise's vision or the version that he wanted to release in 1979 but couldn't due to obviously um, the time frame to get the film finished it would take him 20 years to get the film finally complete or 21 years finally complete. you know um, but getting back to this brand new director's edition another 20 years from when it came out on DVD to this brand new 2022 remaster I think he would have been proud of the work that's been done on this I mean, David C. Fine, Darren R. Doctor, Mike Matissano and everyone else who who was involved at getting this to the screen like Bruce Botnick who as well um, it was a truly epic effort to get this to back on the like to where it should be you know and as I say I think they've done Robert Wise proud I think he would be happy at the version that we finally have might have taken 40 43 years to get here but it was a good 43 year wait it really is. I mean, this this new this new direct edition. Um, obviously, it's how long was it? Before? Two thousand four. It's one hundred and thirty-seven minutes, and I think that the original direct edition was about one hundred and thirty-six. Um, the TV version was one hundred and forty-two minutes which is about two hours, two hours 22. But then it had some stuff that was excised, you know. Uh, especially there was one sequence that wasn't complete. Um, and that was Kirk coming out of the ship. He's in a completely different suit to what he's in a bit later on. And there's one shot where he's coming out of the airlock from like a, a long, a long shot. And it wasn't complete. Special effects weren't even put in, so you could see all the scaffolding. And it was completed by a YouTube user Vernon Wilmer Video. And I used it in my hybrid cut edit that I'd done a couple of years ago. But it's been completed for this release. And for this version of the special longer version, it's in the film. As it should have been. They actually went and completed the scene. And when you see it, it's just like, yeah, that actually does look pretty cool. But it's just a shame they couldn't have rotoscoped the suit that Kirk's wearing onto it, but that's about 
Anyway, um, that's my take on the movie. You know, in a nutshell, I love the film. No matter what version, I love it. I enjoy it. It's fantastic. I, I, for me, it's a, it's a great, great film. There's a lot of things to it. You just have to you just have to dig a little deeper than what is there. So, what I'm going to do now is unbox this. I mean, I've already opened it up to check the contents, see if it's all there. And what you get in this deluxe packaging, I mean, this this was 60 quid. 60 quid. The American, the American release, I think, was about $90, which is about 80 quid now due to the exchange rate. And you get two less discs, which sucks, because with our 4K releases over here, you get a Blu-ray with it as well. You don't in the US, I think you just get a digital download code. So this has got two bonus Blu-rays, and it's got the 4K remastered direct edition on one, and then on the other one, you've got the, the theatrical edition, the, the 2021 remaster of it. And the special longer version, which is exclusive just to this set. And that's the reason why I got this. Because it's got the special longer version. It's not on standard 4K release of the theatrical edition. It's not on the standard 4K release of the director's edition that came out yesterday as well. Um, it's exclusive to this set. So, and this is what I mean by where it says the complete adventure. So it's got all three versions. What I, I mean, what I would have liked is the unremastered 1979 theatrical version as well. But I've got the Legends of the Final Frontier box set with that in. So I've still got a copy, so I'm happy with that. But this set. I had a look at it yesterday and it's absolutely phenomenal. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take it out. The outer box is a little bit on the thin side, but I do like that artwork. That is actually pretty sweet. It's still got the rainbow effect from the original um, theatrical poster, like three-face poster. And I do love the fact that the, the fact, sorry, that the Enterprise is at warp in this. That is some seriously beautiful artwork. I love that. Now, this is a fold out. I mean, I would have liked to it for it to have been in like one of those things, like in uh, the James uh, the Bond 50 box set, where you've got two individual books. You open them out. Um, the discs are held in hard card. But this opens out like that. You've got a note from Robert Wise, which was the original note from 2001. And then it opens out again. So there. And then it opens out for the other three discs. And as you can see, that is a reproduction of a poster that was released. And it is absolutely awesome. I love that carway. Absolutely love that carway. Someone actually um, has done an Enterprise model like that. They've actually done the cutaway at the at the engineering deck on the um, on the the saucer section, things like that. And it looks absolutely amazing. Search for it on online and have a look at it. It's a brilliant model. Absolutely phenomenal model, and it's great what people are actually doing with models nowadays. It really is. So with this set, you actually get quite a load of quite a load of stuff. Some people are trying to say, "Oh, it's just junk. It's just junk." But the thing is, I actually quite like. I actually quite like all this stuff. I really do. I think it's because it's basically it's what was released at the time, and it's all re reproductions. So first of all, you've got uh, four. Lobby cards. I'm not going to take these out of there. Actually, no, I won't take. Them. Actually, no, I won't. Um, can I get these out of there? No, I can't get them out of there. So they're actually going to stay in there. There's four lobby cards there. Four reproduction lobby cards. Um, I, I don't actually know what's. If you look at the, if you look just there, hopefully the cam uh, the camera will thingy. But you've got them all there. 
and you've got a shot of the whole crew on the recreation deck. Spock, Kirk, Spock and McCoy, and there's one of Kirk in the captain's chair with Spock behind him. They are pretty cool. They are pretty cool cards, and they're actually going to... They are actually going to stay like that, and it actually says not for reproduction, they've been reproduced. <laughs> I like that. I like that. The next one is a set of decals. Um, again, reproductions of the original decals. And they are actually pretty cool, I must admit. I do like the fact that they've made Kirk's hair a dark blonde instead of uh, brown. <laughs> but still, though, faithful reproductions. And I actually do quite like them. They're pretty cool. Now, the next one. Well, the next lot, sorry, is four bumper stickers. Four bumper stickers, or they call them laptop stickers now. And the first one is uh, blue in colour. It's got Spock, the Enterprise, and it says, I'm a Trekkie. And I must admit, I do quite like that one. That's pretty cool. Now, the next one is... Um, Beam me up, Mr. Spock, and I must admit, Kirk and Spock and that one don't look all that good, but still, it's nice to have it. Really is nice to have this. Now, this is one. This is one I wish that I could get another one of, because I would put this on my car. I really would. <laughs> I love this. Federation vehicle, official use only. That would go on my car. That really would. That's, oh, I love that. That's pretty cool. And then you've got one for, uh, which I think has got an actual picture of um, Mr. Spock on there. And it's actually got Star Trek, the motion picture. Now these are proper vinyl stickers. And I must admit, they are, they are all pretty cool. I mean, the only one that kind of lets it down for me is, um, as I say, the Kirk and Spock there. You know, it kind of looks like they've got something wrong with their faces. Um, I think it's supposed to be like all shiny and that, but it kind of, it kind of stands out for me. So I'm going to bury that. Now the next thing you also get is a reproduction of Bob Peak. It's an absolutely amazing poster, as seen for the theatrical rerun. The new director's edition it encompasses Bob Peake's artwork of the Enterprise at the bottom, but obviously added with the, uh, the electricity things and, and obviously that they've been moved up, and you've had the like the, the little like white lines, whatever they are, there added. Um, but that is a sweet poster. I love this. Would I have liked it a little bit bigger? I would have, but that's being greedy. I'm just glad that they put a poster in there as well. This, when I'm eventually in the States, this will be going up on the wall alongside the original version of the theatrical poster that I've printed out and mounted and framed. Which I'm not going to get out because it's buried. Um, but yeah. As I say, I do love the fact that they used the faces from the original Bob Peak artwork. And I do love... Um, his artwork for the uh, for the five Star Trek first five Star Trek movies. Um, his his artwork was just phenomenal. Really was phenomenal. Really love um, looking at it. It's just it's just it's just fantastic. It's just you don't see that kind of artwork now unless you um, get a boutique. Um, video label release like um, Robocop on, uh, from Arrow um, I can't remember the artist's name so I do, I do apologise but his, his artwork on the hard box for the limited edition version of Robocop and also for Waterworld as well the same version like same edition hard box and that his artwork's actually pretty phenomenal and it does hark back to 70s and the 80s where it was all like all hand drawn and stuff like that um, I do love artwork like that. Always Photoshop one of like they're looking in different directions, like you know. 
it's just generic generic photoshop crap and like i don't i don't like it never have them never have them um but anyway getting back to the um the bits and pieces the bits and pieces um the last one is this it's the star trek the motion picture archives it's a booklet and you've got all these like um things on the front cover like the uh, the original poster the very original poster that was done of the uh, the enterprise and that is the original i think that was the matt jeffries concept art was it matt jeffries yes i think it was it was matt jeffries matt jeffries concept art for what the enterprise was going to be and as you can see there it's still got the original deflector dish um and it's got a variant of the nacelles that would be on the eventual refit enterprise and eagle moss did actually release a model of that and i think that was the original uh, it was for phase two when it was going to be a, uh, a tv series to launch the then new paramount network and um i must admit i do like that and as i say i've got the model and it is, it is a pretty pretty good model pretty good looking model um and then you've got on the back you've got all the other various um, merchandise like cards uh, a peel off graphics book uh, i believe that they were patches or stickers that came out you've got decals you've got as i say you've got pin badges you've got cards like uh, cards that you could collect and stuff like that and then when you open it up you've got things like design artwork you know, I think it was from Ralph McQuarrie and, again, Matt Jeffries and things like that. I won't go through the whole book because I'm going to leave some for, obviously, if you do decide to get this. And I believe you should. You know, this is just some of the treasures inside. And it is a fantastic book. An absolutely fantastic book. Um, it's just a treasure trove of concept art drawings photos um behind the scenes photos and things like that um especially with the original wing walk uh, the concept um you've also got from the original version and the 4k edition and early concept art and it is it's just a fantastic book fantastic book um so that's all the um, promotional merchandise. And as I say, you get five, uh, five discs. Um, you get a bonus disc with a load of special features on. Uh, you've got the legacy special features from the original Director's Edition DVD from 2001. And also from the original 2009 Blu-ray. But you've also got new special features as well. Um, You've got an eight-part documentary called The Human Adventure, and it is well worth a watch. It's a fantastic documentary on the making of the film. Um, I think the parts are only like about um, five, six, maybe even ten minutes each, but it is a really great watch. Fantastic documentary. Um, and then you've also got newly discovered deleted scenes. There's only three... But they have been much talked about for years, much lost. There's some people that, that thought that they weren't filmed. Um, but when they went back and they'd done the ADR for this, because they managed to find the, the, the loops, like the, the additional dialogue recording samples that, that Bob Wise directed and oversaw in that, when they found them, they found them for these deleted scenes and then they found them in the archive, the actual video. There are some parts that don't have audio. They've got subtitles, which is fair enough. Because those parts were um, were lost and they're still lost even today, which is a shame. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what the deleted scenes are, babe, but it's great to see them. It's a shame that they're incomplete with the subtitles, but it's great that they've been found and you can watch them and you can enjoy them and see them as they originally were supposed to have been seen back then um, and then obviously you've got as I say you've got the two 4k discs 
um, one disc with the, the new direct edition on and the other one's got the branching editions of theatrical hobby and the special longer version and then you've got two added blu-rays again same contents direct edition on one theatrical special longer edition branching on another disc so we get two bonus discs over what the American release has and that's a shame so overall for the money paid I would say that this is the most complete version of the film you will ever see and I think that David C. Fine, Darren R. Docterman, Mike Matisse, and Bruce Botnick and every, everyone else can pat themselves on the back with this because not only have they done the film that Robert Wise wanted to do in 79 but they've taken great care to make it future proof because as Bob Wise says no film is truly complete and I believe that when watching the original 79 version of Star Trek The Motion Picture and then watching the direct edition you can see how far it's come and you can see the differences that have been made to make it better paced better film overall you know if you did want to watch a start like the motion picture I mean obviously if you watched the 79 version and you didn't like it maybe the direct edition will change your mind maybe you'll, you'll go actually it's alright still not a great film for me I wouldn't watch it again but it's better than it was or even if it changes your perception of it and you think actually that is a really good film and it's done its job I will always love this movie I will always champion it because there's more to it than a ship going to intercept an energy cloud with something in the middle of it you know it doesn't sound like much of a plot but the underlying themes once you once you watch it once, maybe twice, maybe three times. It's one of those films that deserves re-watching so you can fully get everything. There is more to it than the base plot. When you understand it, you will get a lot more out of it. I do believe this. I really do believe this. And that is why I will always love this film. Always, always love this film. I mean, I, I, I saw the theatrical showing of this two weeks ago and watching it on the big screen seeing all those special effects on the big screen hearing Jerry Goldsmith's music all around my ears it was an experience and it was something that I'm glad I was able to do and that is one ticked off my bucket list and another one that was ticked off my bucket list on Sunday was Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan. It was the director's cut of that one as well. Remastered in 4K. And again, it was just great to see it on the big screen. And it's one that, again, I'm glad I watched. So anyway, that's it for this first episode of my Star Trek special for Use One Retro Goes to the Movies. The next episode, I will be looking at Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And uh, going over going over that and looking at the, uh, the Blu-ray that was released last year. Of the, uh, it was a 4K remaster. Both cuts. Um, unless, obviously, if I get the 4K box set with them all in. In which case, then I'll have a look at that. Um, but until then, this is User 1 Retro signing off saying... Thank you very much for watching, goodbye for now, and live long and prosper.